Okay, hello, this is uh, another video. This is part four of the placenta series of five, placental abruption. The overview, part one and two and three discussed the normal anatomy, variations in pathology and placenta previa. And now we will focus on placental abruption. The definition will be part of what we present today. Risk factors, what are typical symptoms, what is required for the diagnosis, and what is the management of a abruption. And of course, we finish with a, a nice summary with the key points. Placental abruption, per definition, is a part when the placenta is partly or completely separated from the uterine wall before the baby is born. After the baby is born, that's completely appropriate and desired, but this is not the situation before the baby is born. What is the underlying pathology? Well, do realize that the problem is the abruption commences with the rupture of one of the maternal vessels in the decidua basalis. There's ma some maternal vessels, not fetal vessels. So, as we might know from part one, the decidua basalis is the endometrium changed through pregnancy hormones which lies under the placenta, between the placenta and the myometrium. You could also argue that this is so that placental abruption is caused by a placental vascular accident. Well, that's not a well-known um, abbreviation, but I made it up myself, PVA. Um, this is once more the diagram of the placenta. We're familiar with that in the meantime. And this is the myometrium, and this is the decidua basalis. This is the endometrium, just under the myometrium. And here you see the placenta. What happens, look at these blood vessels here, if a, a small bleeding starts, there's nothing, there's no, nothing which could possibly stop the bleeding. The bleeding will separate and eventually, so the bleeding between the decidua and the placental interface and the next splitting or the sacking of the placenta can occur partly or completely. So this is the underlying pathology. If I now would ask you the question, what are risk factors? You probably can think of a few applying common sense. For instance, any pre-existing vascular condition, such as poorly controlled diabetes. Smoking, drug abuse, well known is cocaine, also called crack, and um, it's a vas vasoactive substance. So apparently the quick dilatation and narrowing of blood vessels could result in an abruption. Trauma, very well known, a motor wheel accident, MVA, which results in shearing forcings where the placenta is no longer able to follow the surface of the uterus as it were. So every lady after a motor wheel accident or after significant trauma needs to observe, be observed for a few hours just to exclude that a partial abruption has taken place. Um, a fall, domestic violence, sometimes women present with, well, I had a little mishap on the kitchen floor but we always need to be mindful that sometimes it's a presentation of domestic violence sad enough and then of course growth restriction of the baby which quite often of course is a consequence of underlying pathology multiple gestation and polyadramnios are risk factors and of course as always a previous history of placental abruption which of course is quite often secondary to one of the above risk factors about the incidence, roughly 1% in singleton pregnancies, the um, partial abruption takes place usually around 6 to 8% in the third trimester and is then associated with antepartum hemorrhage, APH. The true incidence is probably much higher. We could argue that many cases may present with small bleeding antepartum and that quite often don't present, so there is probably underreporting. 
What are typical findings for an abruption? It can vary, so it can be a little bit of a can of worms. The most common presentation is, however, antepartum hemorrhage combined with continuous abdominal pain and CTG changes if at least the abruption is significant. On examination, the uterus is very tender on palpation and does not relax in between. So there is not that differentiates from um, antepartum, so preterm labor, where we have contractions and relaxation of the uterus. So the uterus does not relax anymore. Antepartum hemorrhage is the case in 80 to 90 percent of all cases. If you are thinking of doing a rotation in France, here is how the French express is uterus en bois. That means the uterus is as hard as a piece of wood or uterine tetany. Au cure du syndrome de Cuvulaire, lors d'une hématome rétroplacentaire, contracture uterine douloureuse. Well, that's a mouthful. If you go to Paris, the city of love and the city of lights, be prepared. By the way, let's go back to on, on a more serious note. Concealed hemorrhage is the case in 10 to 20% of the cases. I'll explain that later. Concealed means no external bleeding, visible, no nodes of bleeding, PV, per vagina. The Cuvelaire uterus, the French word I just tried to explain, uh, express so beautifully, this is a picture at a cesarean section. The uterus has been exteriorated and here is the uterus visible. By the way, here we see the ovaries, the left and the right ovary. And you can see that the uterine myometrium is engorged by blood. It's extravasation of the blood via the placental bed throughout the myometrium below the serosa, the surface of the uterus. So this is the typical cuvelaire uterus. The symptoms can vary, as I just expressed before, and sometimes the CTG can point indirectly at a, an ab abruption. So there are frequent uterine contractions. By the way, the definition of tachycystole is uh, more or equal to six contractions per minute. If the tachycystole goes together with the CTG changes per definition, we refer to that as hyperstimulation. Be aware of the definitions. Sometimes we can check blood, the D-dimer, and the D-dimer tells us that there is an increased use of fibrinogen degradation products, and that points at a hyperfibrinolytic status. So an elevated D-dimer sometimes can point at a sneaky partly abruption without any other of the typical symptoms I discussed before. And other symptoms, signs of hypovolemia, and it's very difficult if there is uh, no obvious external bleeding, still the lady can lose quite some blood internally in a concealed abruption, or external, a significant external PV bleeding, antepartum hemorrhage. As rule of thumb, of hypovolemia, if the systolic blood pressure is less than the, than the her pulse rate, that is a simple definition for hypovolemia, apart from the other typical symptoms, so uh, clammy, cold skin um, and her uh, facial expression, which expresses fear. The differential diagnosis of pain in pregnancy is very extensive. Of course, we think of obstetrical causes and non-obstetrical causes. The obstetrical ones, the abruption, preterm labor, right upper quadrant pain or epigastric pain point at a severe uh, variation of preeclampsia, what we call the HELP syndrome, hemolysis, elevated liver function and low platelets, or sometimes quite innocent, musculoskeletal pain. Non-obstetrical, appendicitis, renal stone, pancreatitis, and other rare causes, such as a splenic artery, bleeding spe splenic artery aneurysm, and so forth and so on. So always think about both obstetrical and non-obstetrical causes. 
Let's go back now to a few diagrams, the placental abruption. Here is a beautiful diagram on the left hand side which shows a so-called partial abruption which goes together with antepartum hemorrhage. The partial abruption, we see here the hematoma form forms and this part, the lower part of the placenta has detached. The upper part here is still detached and thanks to that the fetus is still alive. And the fetus might be, in this picture, struggling. You might see CG changes. On the other hand, in the right panel we see a complete abruption of the placenta. And the, and the bleeding moreover is completely concealed, is covered. It's not detectable because the blood clot stays uh, between the placenta here, which has been detached completely, and the uterine wall. Also of notice that the placenta here has white patches, and these white patches represent infarct. Diagnostic for complete abruption is apart from the clinical symptoms that we are unable to um, uh, demonstrate the fetal heart rate anymore, so fetal demise has taken place. Let's once more look at the macroscopically at the maternal surface of the placenta. This is the placenta, a medical cord, and here we see the typical retroplacental clot which demonstrates a partial abruption. This part of the placenta is also characterized by multiple infarcts, so a small placenta and a small baby. The retro placenta clot is demonstrated here as part of a partial abruption. What is the management? Well, let's discern between a partial abruption and a normal CDG. The management depends very much on a few variables. The delivery, um, usually we would expedite delivery if there's, uh, we are dealing with recurrent APH. Most likely we will offer cesarean section. Sometimes if we are dealing with a multip who had uh, previously vaginal deliveries and the cervix is already 3-4 cm open, we might aim for vaginal delivery. But the mode and the time of delivery is not a black and white answer. They depend always on a few other variables, the gestational age, the parity, and so forth. By the way, what is scary, if you come up with the diagnosis partial abruption, there is no way to predict how, when the placenta will detach completely. So if you have experienced that once in your practice, in your career, you tend to act when you have a partial abruption because the risk is very high and the consequences can be very, can be eventually catastrophic, fetal demise. The management now of a complete abruption and in combination of course with fetal demise. We have to correct the hypovolemia and possible coagulopathy. We aim in this scenario for vaginal delivery and we have to be aware of the risk of disseminated intervascular coagulation, BPH, and uh, for instance consequences with could be acute tubulous necrosis for the kidneys. The uterus is contracted continuously, so a tetanic uterine contraction, and it's probably an effect of thrombin, and quite often augmentation is not required because the uterus is massively contracted already. Important to offer analgesia, sorry, important to offer analgesia and be mindful of epidural offers perfect analgesia but we have to check that the platelets and the clotting is still working okay because otherwise we might contribute to an epidural hepatoma and we go from bad to worse. Very important of the management, despair is an understatement. This is a dramatic uh, situation for the mother and all conditions involved. The baby has passed away and still needs to be born. The mother is in excruciating pain and in hypervolemic shock. She will sometimes have a near-death experience. Sometimes even she does not recall anything at all. And that hypervolemia um, protects her somewhat from having this extremely uh, sad and disappointing experience. Let's be mindful of the partner, any family or friends present. For them this is a very traumatic experience and we as staff are usually focusing to save the mother's life. 
so essential by the way we feel desperate as well it's very difficult to break bad news to tell a mother who is in pain and hypervolemic that unfortunately her baby has passed away and you are we are managing a sometimes narrow escape situation so quite stressful for us as well essential to underpin that if the acute situation is behind us so the dust has settled somewhat that we offer genuine empathy and debrief the mother and the family and our friends as many times as needed essential and non-negotiable if we do this well this can be one of the most profound human interactions imaginable and it sounds strange so you go from deep valleys to another situation where eventually you have the privilege as an obstetrician to see the mother and her partner again a few years later hopefully with a good outcome of course that makes our profession so special let's summarize now for the placenta previa and acuita i will refer to the uh, other derailable videos and for abruption the typical history is antepartum hemorrhage continuous pain uh, with CDD changes and other pointers for the diagnosis are the very subtle tachycystole so more or equal to six uterine contractures per minute sometimes an increase of the d-dimer can pour, point at a um, hematoma retroplacental hematoma and what I didn't mention maybe but the ultrasound in the acute stage is not helpful and is completely different from the placenta previa the management for complete abruption is aiming for vaginal delivery um, for complete abruption depends whether you aim for normal vaginal delivery or perform a cesarean section and of course the management always think about the human dimension for both the mother the family including yourself and your staff and always be prepared for massive pph and disseminated intervascular coagulation we have to differentiate the pain with preterm labor. So, my goodness, I think if you, if the placenta had a consciousness, he or she would feel quite nervous. The placenta is on one hand a fascinating organ, vital for fetal well-being, referred to the roga part one and two, should not cover the internal os in the third trimester, otherwise we're dealing with the placenta priva as discussed in part three and as discussed here should detach completely only after the fetus is born we will discuss in another drug video that the placenta should last but not least not invade the uterus beyond the maternal decidua placenta acuita will be discussed in placenta part five okay it's time for me to walk jimmy and of course if you like the videos if they think they have added value feel free to subscribe and by the way you will um, you will get an email alert if there's a new video available yeah on behalf of my zen master in chief jimmy thank you so much for your attention i'm looking forward to part five which will be on the web very soon thank you